Technology both drives the economy and is driven by the economy, and it will change dramatically how we live, as I think most people listening to this uh, have experienced in their lifetimes. Computers simply take over. Uh, we've traced the evolution of computers, uh, but, but as we move into the late 80s and into the early 90s, they really become dominant uh, uh, in, in both business and social world. In 1971, Intel invents the microprocessor. That's that little thing up there on the top left. And this allows for the creation of extremely complicated small devices. And then the Altair 8800 is produced. Um, this is a, a, a computer that sold to the public um, through like mail order and things like popular mechanics and stuff. And uh, uh, it's really only for geeks who want to take a computer and figure out how it works. It has no monitor. You have to hook up your own monitor up to it. Um, it, it uh, and you have to program it yourself. You don't turn it on and just start clicking things with a mouse. I mean, you have to type in the code to make it do what you want. But there is a, a group of kind of pioneers out there who are interested in this machine and interested in coding it and, to, and trying to turn it into a useful device. One of these guys is a Harvard student named Bill Gates who orders one of these. He and his roommate Paul Allen, they love to play around on these things and write code. And Bill Gates will eventually take his code and actually another guy's code who he talks out of uh, for a very small amount of money and create an operating system to make computers much more usable for regular people so it's not just for the nerds. This is the importance of Bill Gates and this is why he ends up being so rich. A separate group of guys who are interested in computers are in San Francisco and they're building their own computers from scratch. Um, and Steve Jobs and his partner Steve Wozniak are in this group. By 1977 they've created the Apple II, it's actually their second attempt, and it's the first consumer computer, the first computer you might go buy off the shelf, take home, um, and, and, and try to use at home, although these things were far more difficult to use than they are today. By 1981, IBM wants to get in on this, and they introduce a line of computers they call the, the PC, the personal computer. And they contract with Bill Gates to use his programming language, his disk operating software, um, which, is, uh, which is where we get the company Microsoft. By 1984, uh, uh, Apple has adopted um, some software that was actually being used by defense industries to create a Windows-based computer, the Macintosh, uh, which greatly improves the ease of use um, of the computer. By 85, Microsoft uh, uh, stealing this, uh, uh, borrowing, adapting, whatever, this same technology from the defense industry will create their own version, which is called Windows. Apple then makes what I think is, is uh, clearly a poor business decision to not share its um, programming language, um, uh, meaning that there are far fewer programs that end up being written for the Apple uh, than, than for uh, Microsoft-based programs. Microsoft uh, uh, puts their programming language out open source so anybody can code in it. There ends up being far more programs for the, uh, for the PC than the Apple, and the PC crushes the Apple. Uh, uh, another thing that's going on is secondary companies begin moving in and making PCs like Hewlett Packard, um, uh, eventually Dell, Gateway, lots of other companies. And so there's just a lot more PCs out there. And in this first, uh, uh, well really through today, uh, PCs, uh, computers running Microsoft, uh, will be far more common um, than Apple computers. And this will stimulate the economy in a huge way, creating thousands of ancillary companies, making not only computers, but uh, software, um, computer accessories. Um, and and we, we eventually will get to the point where computers will be in, in virtually every home in America. But of course, uh, 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 and, and here is, this is from a movie, uh, these are actors, but um, here is a great example of the kind of uh, dominance of PC over Apple during this period. Of course, many people don't have much use for computers until computers become social in some capacity. And that's going to be made possible by the Internet. The Internet begins as a government program in 1963. Uh, uh, government research facilities develop something called ARPANET. And this connects government research facilities, just other government research facilities. You see the map there of these. Um, so they can exchange data um, over a primitive version of the Internet. By the early 1960s, the RAND Corporation has developed a uh, technology called store and forward packet switching that allows information to be passed um, through other computers. Uh, so you can create a network of computers and the information is flowing through the entire network, uh, if that makes sense. By 1971, there is a whopping 23 computers hooked up on ARPANET and they're exchanging technical data for, for scientific purposes. But then corporations begin to understand the use of this 
And they begin to uh, uh, join onto the ARPANET and, and use this data exchanging service. Of course, by 2009, there will be well over a billion computers hooked up to the Internet, but that's a long way away. In the early 1980s, uh, the Department of Defense, who had actually been the primary driver of the Internet, will back out of it concerned about security as, as more and more uh, uh, corporations and, and, and uh, uh, universities are plugging into this data sharing uh, network. Uh, the Department of Defense doesn't want any part of it. They're scared people will steal our secrets. And, and that's a key moment here because then the Internet basically becomes free range. Uh, once the government largely backs out of it, um, it begins to develop on its own. Very quickly, we're going to see email developed, and we're going to begin to see an explosion of people using um, uh, the Internet uh, first at work and then for personal use. Um, and, of course, this is going to be done the old-fashioned way over the phone line. Um, the early Internet was really impossible to use. I remember somebody inviting me over to use message boards where you had to call a specific number, and then it was just like a, a text, and you had to type stuff in. It was, it was awful. It was, it was, to my mind anyway, fairly unusable. But then a man named Tim Berners-Lee, and this is a really important figure in history. He's down there on the bottom left. He will create an interface um, to make the, the Internet much more navigable and easy to use. Um, he calls it the World Wide Web. And the whole idea of clicking and having an address bar and being able to move from site to site without having to log off the Internet and get back on the Internet are all going to be innovations that derive out of this World Wide Web. Um, today, of course, this, this has created some problems. Uh, uh, something we call the digital divide, for example, if you look at that chart on the bottom right, um, uh, where we, we, we begin to see rapid economic growth um, in countries that have uh, a lot of access to the Internet uh, and, of course, very slow economic growth in countries that don't. And so this has just become one more way to separate the haves and the have-nots glo globally and, and to make it more difficult for lesser developed nations to compete. So that's one side effect of the development of the Internet.